Hello and welcome to Dinish Guarda, Cities ABC, Open Business Council, YouTube podcast series. We are here once again to discuss the challenges and opportunities we face in the world in a time where artificial intelligence and the fourth industrial revolution are taking the world by a storm, but as well changing most of the narratives that we are going through as humanity, as a society. We have been interviewing fantastic personalities in our last uh, one year of uh, this series. I think we are close to 200 people and I'm very excited because each new person brings a wealth of knowledge and as well a, a wealth of experience that is quite unique. And uh, today it's kind of the case. It's someone that I wanted to have here for a long time. And I, I will just start with a, a small quote about AI because uh, we're talking about the personality of AI. Is AI, um, is kind of changing everything. Um, and I, I want to, to use precisely a quote from Ray um, that is, is one of the persons that actually Susan O, oh, that is our guest today, is using. But I, I want to, to look at, uh, just start with this quote and then start with the interview and I'll read the, the bio because I think it's particularly interesting and the wealth of experience of Susan. So I want to start with this. Our intuition about the future is linear. But the reality of information technology is exponential, and that makes a profound difference. If I take 30 set steps linearly, I get to 30. If I take 30 set steps exponentially, I get to a billion. So this is from Ray Kurzweil, which is one of the personalities that I deeply admire and been studying for years, and is actually working with Susan. So Susan Ho, uh, which is our special guest today, is someone that I deeply respect in a lot of areas as a friend and as someone that is kind of changing the world. So she is a thought leader and as well a writer and researcher that has been doing a lot of work. And actually she started uh, as a former journalist since, since the age 16, where she collaborated with the likes of CNBC, uh, EIU and Newsweek. And she speaks in the biggest conference around the world that actually I've had in the conference uh, on digital financial inclusion, uh, including the UN General Assembly and the Vatican Pontifical Academy of Maths and Science. That's a quite good one. And the World Economic Forum, to say just some of them. And um, one of the things that amazed me about Susan is her energy, her capacity to look at the world in a more ethical and as well technological and as well sociological and social impact. At the moment, Susan Ho is the CMO of B Omni, Behind Imagination, the world's most advanced humanoid AI robots. That is the brainchild of the XPRIZE co-founder, Eric Knorr, and the inventor, Ray Kurzweil, of course, uh, quite known worldwide as an author and as well as a researcher, as well the former chief scientist of Google. And it has the funding and back by the likes of Tony Robbins and a lot of other global personalities. Susan is a recipient of the Quantum Impact Award, Decade of Women, in partnership with the UN General Assembly as one of the top 10 frontier women in digital. And uh, she normally advocates and works around the areas of AI and blockchain and the role it has in our society, and as well as been serving in the UN Sustainable Developing Goals as an ambassador and as well pushing forward these ideas. She's as well an advisor and global ambassador for Neoflow Asset Management, Impulse for Women, and she's the founder of Mucker AI, abbreviation of Muck Record, and she'll explain that, and co that she co-founded and serves as a responsible CEO that uses machine learning to grade the trustworthiness of content based on source behavior, which is more important than ever in our times. Susan is a founding board member of the Blockchain Commission for Sustainable Developing, um, which has the support of the Office of Partnerships of the UN General Assembly. So this is just a, a summary of the personality that we have here because she does a lot of other things, but this is quite amazing. And uh, I wanna welcome to our series, Susan. I'm very excited to have you here. Thanks so much, Dennis. It'll be so much fun. Okay, so Susan, I, I want to go and, um, well, we know each other for some time, but I want to go a bit about, uh, uh, from your introduction and about you and education, because you start with 16 writing and doing a lot of things. So you, you were very advanced for most of the teenagers of the time, and any time actually, 
but I want to know what how that made who you are. And of course, you have a multi ethical base, which I love that because it's actually wonderful because it's much more wealth of dealing with cultures. So a bit of that background from Canada to the world and as well to, to the education and what made you get all this activity and who you are. Uh, well, I became a journalist I, in a way through my love of reading and writing uh, because I couldn't understand who my parents were and I couldn't understand the world. Uh, I was born in uh, Seoul, South Korea, which is about uh, 40 minutes from the world's most heavily armed border called the Demilitarized Zone. And uh, soon after I was four years old, uh, my family moved to Iran, uh, to Isfahan, Iran, where uh, my father was an industrial engineer. But after living there for two and a half years and a really a beautiful period of time, uh, before extremism took over that country, uh, we had to leave again very quickly. And so, um, you know, having going from a military dictatorship where my parents didn't see very many opportunities, uh, you know, for their three daughters, then going to, uh, you know, Isfahan, Iran, where it was really quite beautiful and we had to leave very quickly uh, because of increasing violence due to the Islamic revolution happening. And then moving to London, uh, where we were stuck in limbo for about uh, six to eight months, um, basically without status, because London wasn't going to take us and we couldn't go back to Korea because my father would have you know, been, faced consequences for ditching the passport office. And finally, uh, uh, one of his business partners in Canada sponsored us uh, and welcomed us into Canada. And so uh, those experiences, made me want to understand the world better, obviously, and why uh, our family um, had those experiences. But, you know, Asian parents aren't very good at talking about these things. And so um, I had to read them. I had to read and become a, a journalist and, a, and um, a researcher of history and uh, political history and economic history to try and understand uh, some of my experiences from childhood. And it gave me the framework uh, to better understand the world. Wow, that's, thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's really, I, I didn't know all these details, but it's really amazing. And I think it's really important because I think we, most of the world population is living in their bubbles and with digital is even more, more closed bubbles. But this is amazing because you went through some of the most complex countries in the world to one of the countries that is one of the most open in the world. So I, I want, before I go into your career, how did that change as well? Because it's quite hardcore for a child to go through countries, of course, being born in between South Korea and North Korea, which is kind of one of the most challenging still, even now. Um, and of course, Iran, which is another challenging event for there. And of course, almost being mostly being a refugee as well. So it's kind of really hardcore. So how did that change? Of course, there was the part of trying to understand your family and emotions, but as well change who you are as a personality, because of course that makes you out of the box, because you, you cannot really put in the box. And, and I feel that as well. I, I, I didn't have this kind of challenges, but living between multiple countries, at a certain point, you start thinking global. It's, it's of course, you think more about people, less about the culture, the, and the culture is sometimes like a, an operating system that can be very harsh, and it can actually not allow you to progress and to move forward. And in some cases, actually create very toxic relationship. So I would like to touch that from a personal level. The way I see it is that, you know, um, great. I, I wasn't because I was a child and because I was growing up, I wasn't consciously aware that it was challenging. I just knew that, oh God, like, I just don't understand, like, <laughs> you know, um, and, and I think with great challenges and with trauma, um, there's one of two things that can happen. I guess one of three things is that, um, you can become an aggressor uh, and completely give up because it can be very overwhelming, especially PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, or um, you can become, or I could, I could have become really shut down and beleaguered and decided that I didn't care through moral exhaustion, or I can work through my feelings and uh, work through my thoughts and work through my sensations and really question why it was that I felt this way. Uh, why was it that I think in, in some of the ways? Uh, and once I do that work, then all it 
all it could do was leave me with a greater sense of compassion and a wider, deeper, and more nuanced view of human experience in the world, right? So I, I like to always say that I'm a, I'm a um, idealist and a synthesis without illusion. Uh, it's very hard to tackle um, some of the most pressing concerns of the world without being fully aware of, um, of everything that it entails and exactly examining what those things mean to me. Like, what does good mean to me? Uh, what, what matters to, to people on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, there's a universe, we, we're all very uh, individual and nuanced, but, it, um, but I believe there's a universal arc of people who want to have a better life, who desire peace, who want working systems, and who want to partake and be able to contribute in those functioning economies. Oh, that, that's very special. And as well, I think it, it, it's something that I try to nurture, at least my children and, and my environment. And even me, I, I try to keep understanding how the other person feels, not just my way, because that's the biggest challenge that we have nowadays, especially with technology opening so much doors, but as well creating other noise and people very, very easily go to that different direction. So I want to touch one thing. So um, you started as a journalist on national radio with the CBC at age 16 uh, and simultaneous on hair reporter during the Seoul um, Olympics. Um, so can you tell us about that experience? Because of course, 16 working with the Olympics and as well with CBC, that's quite an impressive one. So I wanna hear about that experience because I'm sure uh, that they knew who you are now as well. Well, it was like, a, it was a total accident in a way because I went to go visit my father in Korea and, you know, uh, he's not like a cuddly, cuddly dad. So he's like, yeah, go to work. Um, you know, I volunteered <laughs> you for the Olympics and I got you a job. And we were working for the European Broadcasting Union uh, because at the time in 1988 in Seoul, not many people spoke uh, Korean and English and French very well. And so we were, uh, you know, we were, because we're Canadian, we were bilingual, uh, English and French. And of course we uh, are, are Korean, of Korean descent. And my parents always said, you have to be able to argue with us in our own language. You know, there's this, that was just not uh, negotiable. So I went to um, Korea to spend summers with my dad and work for the European Broadcasting Union. And I was on a tour bus of Europeans and I cracked a joke about, a, there was a guy who was peeing up against the wall at a traffic stop. And I don't think he realized or cared. There was about 130 people in a, in a tour bus watching him peeing on the wall. And I said, oh, that must be a political dissenter or a political activist. And some guy started laughing in the back. And it was, the, uh, it was journalists from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So I stuck my head up back and I said, hey, who here speaks English? And it was a journalist from the, from the CBC. And they had snuck onto the European Broadcasting Union tour bus um, uh, because you know the Canadians didn't really have a budget and they didn't have their own tour bus. <laughs> And so we started talking and they said, well, what are the Europeans paying you for translator? Uh, because, you know, we don't really have a budget for that. We're a really small radio team. And I told them and they said, oh, well, I'll give you five bucks an hour and I'll put you on air if you want to help us do some of these stories and interview Korean people. Uh, and to me, uh, these journalists, it was, you know, uh, Nancy Durham and, and John Spittle, uh, they were in my 16 year old eyes, just the coolest grownups I'd ever met. Uh, they were inherently curious and they asked a lot of questions and they allowed me to ask questions and they really wanted to observe and learn. Uh, and so I was like, you know, I would do anything for you. I'll just, I'll even just carry your bags, but sure, if I get to be on air, uh, that would be fun. And so we did um, three stories together and um, I didn't really think, you know, you do this and you have the best of hope because it was so much fun to be around really alive, uh, happy grownups. Because I think, you know, especially in places like Korea, it's very hard to find people who are just inherently so happy doing their job and who are being paid to actively learn and be curious. And so it gave me, it gave me a lot of hope and I didn't have any expectations of it. But then my mother called from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And, I, and she said, what are you doing? I just heard you on radio. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, you know, so, uh, so I launched my journalism career and I always thought what an honor and privilege it is to, uh, to be able to make a living 
uh, tackling, uh, tackling questions, to be paid to learn, and to be paid to learn and to speak with people who have an intimate knowledge of issues and who had tried to solve these problems. Uh, it was my honor and privilege for 25 years, uh, especially as a business journalist, uh, learning different business models and different metrics. And that translated very well uh, later on into my work in technology. That's really inspiring and, and fantastic story as well. So let's go right now from this experience uh, as a teenager to your education. And of course, I, I, I'm interested to hear about your, uh, of course, Canada is very open culture. And of course, South Korea is a much more intense discipline and much more patriarchal experience as well. And as well, very intense sense of uh, society, culture, and tradition, and so forth. So how did that work with you? Because it's quite interesting. You are right now a citizen of the world, working with some of the top technologies in the world <laughs> and the top projects. But I'm sure all of that is, is thinking. And I want to touch that, of course, relation with technology. Oh, geez. Well, you know, one thing you have to be really, well, one thing I had to be really comfortable with are contradictions. Right. Any anyone that works with data and anyone that works with technology, especially when it's nascent and frontier, uh, must be OK with contradictions and hold those contradictions. And people, too. Uh, you know, we didn't love the Romans because they had functioning toilets. We love them because they had functioning toilets and democracy and orgies and depravity. There are a great many contradictions that we must be able to hold <laughs> and make sense of in this world. Right. Uh, so. Yeah, I used to always joke that as a Korean Canadian, it made me very uh, passive aggressive because Korea tends to be very intense, very strong personalities and very homogenous, whereas Canada is by definition uh, in terms of legal and institutional definitions be multicultural and, and open. So I think it gave me the best of both worlds. Uh, it gave me, especially my family because they're third generation industrialists and, and mechanical and petroleum engineers. Whereas I was much more creative and um, expressive. So that yeah. ability to hold different contradictions and to find a bridge between different cultures and find a vernacular that lands with many different groups and to be able to speak and communicate as comfortably uh, with engineers of things that don't yet exist, but that I see very clearly and, and give it emotional resonance uh, that, that I, truly felt and wanted to share, uh, became a really crucial uh, skill set in being able to explain um, the wonders and the beauty that I saw in the technology and the potential for unleashing, unleashing uh, human potential. Yeah, so that brings us to the, the, the main point, of course, of your expertise, both uh, as a technologist and as a, a strategist, both in AI, blockchain, as a leading ex well expert on these areas. So then from your experience, and of course, uh, we mentioned in your bio that you created as well quite young um, uh, Mucker uh, AI. So can you tell us a bit of this background, the first companies you created after the university, what you did and that, how do you become an entrepreneur and as well working with this startup world and technology world? Okay, uh, well, so as you know, I started as a journalist and then I uh, took this internship in Hong Kong um, towards the end of university. And uh, as you know, uh, Hong Kong uh, at the time in 1994 was a completely open capitalist market. And I ended up on the business desk of the South China Morning Post, which is the premier English language broadsheet uh, newspaper. And so uh, it, I was charged with, you know, all the stories that more experienced uh, reporters didn't wanna do which is to cover index companies and uh, also to cover uh, business ethics uh, in a free market system like Hong Kong. Uh, so being able to look at all the different, different um, business models and revenue models, uh, because you, know, you talk to hundreds of people and sometimes a thousand people in a, in a given year of different companies, there's a pattern that emerges and an, and an arc that merges and you know exactly which sets of numbers to put together. And even that was, a, that was a revelation in learning is that numbers don't mean anything unless you correlate them with other numbers that you find the, you know, the relations, uh, relationships between them, correct? To give a picture. Uh, so learn that um, and then went on to cover everything from aviation to finance, um, to listed companies, to film, because I don't think people understand just how complex film and film financing is. Uh, 
uh, they're like miniature startups in a rush. Um, and uh, then in 2008, I moved to the US about six months right before the Great Recession when all the markets tanked. And keep in mind, you know, uh, I, at this point, I'd worked in um, television, radio, newspaper print, as well as uh, advertising, marketing, communications uh, across the board, across radio, TV, outdoor, and direct marketing, which are all very sort of like, you know, but all across the board. And for the first time in my life, I, just, I couldn't find anything, uh, you know, anything to work on in, in 2008. So uh, what I started to do was, uh, so I took any job that I could just to get out of the house and to know, know this new city. I moved to Chicago and, um, you know, I would, I would go out for work as extras work on movie sets and TV series. And I'd work, um, you know, as, as a receptionist at, at different places. And this was after like 20 years, 25 years of experience. Uh, and that, uh, again, was a reminder of, of how different all these different worlds were and, and how different people experienced their lives. And then in 2014, I started writing about technology uh, for a startup called Technori uh, out of Chicago. Uh, Jamie Pritzker, who is now governor of Illinois, was an early investor in that venture. And it was a media and content platform that looked at how to grow the ecosystem by, um, you know, highlighting creators and, and, and uh, profiling companies and startups. So some of those companies that I would profile would turn around and ask me to consult for them as their story strategist and um, community ambassador, community grower. Um, so after I started doing that work, um, I started to be able to take on different and escalating roles as different startup companies enlisted me. And one of them in 2014 was an AI company out of San Francisco. And they had asked me to, uh, basically it was my job to not only come up with the vernacular or the, or the story strategy, but to onboard 30 women uh, entrepreneurs and community leaders to become alpha testers for this technology. So uh, most of these, most of the, the women, mom, entrepreneurs and community leaders in Silicon Valley have their master's degrees at Stanford and Caltech. Uh, and it's a highly competitive environment. So there's, I had to really learn uh, the technology very well and, and also understand how it related to uh, some of their challenges and what they wanted to do uh, in, their, in their given day, in their given lives. So, so that's how it all started. And then, you know, but it just kept going. And then about 2016, I was approached by a technical team that, uh, that had failed to raise funding. And they came on board and asked me to be their CEO uh, to uh, start working on what later became Mucker because I was a journalist. Wow, that's really impressive. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> that's, no, it's not crazy. It's actually amazing. And in the end of the day, I think for people listening to us, it's a great opportunity of the challenge that you had made you who you are now and actually made you super strong because you are uh, one of the leading authorities in a lot of areas precisely because of this kind of out of the box way of thinking. So let's talk about Mooker AI uh, for, for people that don't know how it works, because I, I think it's something more relevant than ever, especially fake news and everything else in the world. So I know that you started some years ago, but a bit of experience and what's going on and what a bit of the what you achieved so far with the project. Okay, sure. Um, so it's probably, you know, I, I like to say that I'm probably like the most uh, like famous failed, um, <laughs> you know, launcher in some ways, because I've, I've been working on this for five years. It took me four years to get to productization alone. So I don't want anybody to think that, you know, any of this stuff is easy or that you're going to, you know, build a billion dollar company or a unicorn and exit in two to three years. That's just some like Silicon Valley bullshit. And it's, it's you know, it's not something that you should always, you know, you should... I don't I think anyone should even aim for because you don't make good products that way and you don't create good technology that way. So essentially, I wanted something that would help um, work as a filter for rapid response teams um, to be able to um, to be able to identify and flag, uh, you know, what what was called fake news or disinformation. And a lot of data companies are now uh, wasn't the only one that started five years ago. There are ones that went on to raise money. They work to varying less degrees that are a collection of crawl bots. They crawl through and they scrape the data and they look at it from a data science perspective. Uh, and I was very adamant from the beginning, having worked as a journalist for 20 years, that people really don't give a shit about facts. 
they care about they care about an uncomplicated truth in a way something that they can they can grasp much more than a nuance you know they want some, they they would rather have an uncomplicated conviction than a complicated truth how's that when it comes to stories right and so uh, I knew that I wanted to create this filter that basically looked at each pieces of the content as a coordinated campaign. So I wanted to build a filter that basically looked at each piece of content, um, online content, and the behavior of it as a coordinated disinformation campaign. Um, the first layer that you can look at is the metadata, right? Uh, where does it come from? What are the associated IP addresses? Uh, and does it work? in tandem in vectors of relationship with other outlets and other servers, right? Uh, then I wanted to look at just even image recognition of the text itself to see, uh, you know, is it a very simple and short ambiguous piece of content, whether it's by video meme or, or text, uh, because if it's simple scant on details, doesn't have a headline, doesn't have a date, doesn't have an author, then chances are it was, uh, it was, it was a piece of a disinformation. So there's all these characteristics, what we call classifiers in machine learning that I could, I could cluster together and have a look at, not to look at whether or not something was credible or looked at the source or look at which parts of it were fake or not, because that is endlessly has variation and almost is impossible uh, to look for patterns in you know, what is true. So I wasn't modeling truth or credibility or what was credible. I was modeling strictly disinformation. Does the behavior of this piece uh, imitate similar behaviors of other disinformation campaigns and bullshit that, that was done simply for ad revenue models or as a joke? Well, this is kind of one of the biggest things. So, so just before we go to, of course, your present ventures and some of the work you did as well, on this level, um, of course, we are in the interstice where, of course, AI right now is becoming mainstream adopted, even if it's in a very incipient uh, capacity, and it's already creating a lot of disruption, both for us individuals, for society, but of course, there's all the manipulation and propaganda that is kind of in history, we always had propaganda. The point right now is the velocity, and as well, the dimension of uh, how it affects our psychologies, how we can manipulate our health, how we can manipulate even our relationships and actually create very toxic environments very fast. And of course, um, I always believe that humanity is very positive, but we have a, a, a part of a dark side that is still present as well. So I think like uh, Stanley Kubrick mentioned something about that we have a bit of a, a virus part of our nature that sometimes is more destructive, um, although nature comes and cleans it. So how do you see this part of the, with your experience working on this technology and the platform and the company, the challenge that you're facing on that direction of anything related to fake news, uh, the concept of truth as well, which is always about perception and you, you are the, yeah. the, the example of a lot of cultures, like you said, the contradictions. How do I will look at that when it comes to technology, especially in the advent of AI, which I want to touch with you. So, so I think AI um, and nascent technologies are agnostic. You're talking about tools. If we look at the greatest technologies throughout the world, there's always a way to use it in a way um, that was not intended, so it lacks fidelity. And most often than not, it's uh, flawed business models. It's flawed business models and flawed uses that weaponize perfectly the technology. Uh, I, I say this quite often, and I will say, uh, Alfred Nobel came up with a dynamite, remember, to save lives so that men wouldn't have to dig in deep holes and it was supposed to be improve and accelerate the quality of laborers' lives as well as industry. And um, it was his dying shame that they turned it around and, and used it as, as um, you know, weapons to kill as many people as quickly as possible. So what we can, you know, the only thing that we can do uh, as builders is look at unintended consequences and look at how to form our business models in a way that incentivizes good actor behavior. And that's where blockchain and tokenization actually works, not only in bringing transparency to how uh, specific tools or, or data are used, but to incentivize uh, good actor behavior and how we want uh, things to be used and what, people, what we want people to do. You, you are as well right now the CMO of Beobni, which is, of course, a very high-profile humanoid robotic AI company. 
And of course, it has some of the leading minds in the world, uh, from one of my heroes, Ray Carswell, but as well, the, one of the founders of XPRIZE, which is kind of amazing, and Tony Robbins, which is as well a very inspirational personality. So can you tell us right now, from all of these things, you yeah. are right now building a robot. And I know that you've been working, we, we discussed yeah. previously, uh, a cat yeah, robot, so I want to hear I'm, that. I'm super I'm so super excited about working with this team, but oh, by the way, so what we're saying about the business model, it just occurred to me, I should um, pinpoint anything that we use to counter fake news and anything that we counter to use uh, propaganda and to weaponize content, we have to dismantle the ad revenue model in some sort of way so that so that companies and people are not rewarded just by exciting, scaring, and terrorizing people into clicking onto things that, that companies make millions, if not billions of dollars in. So, uh, you know, if anybody in the world can help us reimagine the ad revenue model so that we can, we can use these technologies and really good content to inspire people and to look at the right things and to, and to delve more deeply, that's what's really needed in this world. And failing that, we'll just have to come up with better filters. <laughs> okay, so um, Beyond Imagination is the brain trust and lifelong passion of Harry Clore. Uh, and Harry Clore is uh, the founder of XPRIZE Avatar. And I, I, think his, uh, I think his passion and his direction uh, went far before that, um, you know, because Harry was born a cripple uh, as a child. And it wasn't until he was seven or eight years old uh, that he learned how to walk and run. And this entire time then it went, you know, uh, when he was um, sick as a child and not capable of running and, and jumping and playing as other kids do, he imagined a robotic body that would give him the ability to do that, to be superhuman, to augment human beings uh, through robots. And, you know, now in his 50s, um, he's able to do this. So uh, Beyondme is the unit, the company is Beyond Imagination and uh, the founding team is the superstars in technology and culture hacking, as, as you mentioned. Um, uh, that includes, you know, robotics expert, Harry, uh, sorry, Ray Kurzweil, as well as, well as uh, Greg Kamins. Um, on our team, we have guys like uh, William Fisher, who is a gaming expert, as well as John Best, who is, uh, 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 cryptography, blockchain, and fintech expert. Some really some amazing, amazing talent. And what Beyondme actually does is uh, it allows uh, humanoid robots with very finessed movement to be able to be trained by humans from anywhere in the world where hands-on on-site work is needed. And it's, and it's the human being that is training them through a VR set and full haptic suit. Um, with 360 audio on very, very high quality, um, immersive experience of actually being in that robot body. So the robot is trained by humans. Mm -hmm. And as the human is piloting the robot, uh, they can take on um, that person or that instructor can take on passengers within that immersive experience so that they can watch, along, watch and learn along next to the AI brain. And then once the AI is trained on very, very task specific things, uh, then it goes to semi-autonomous and is able to continue teaching those pilots and other human beings the correct way to do specific task, uh, task oriented things. I'm talking, uh, you know, cleaning, uh, doing dishes, making food, caring for the elderly, coming up with simple diagnosis via tele remote by a doctor piloting. Uh, a beyond the unit. And then once, once the AI models are perfected, those training corpuses are, are perfected, and then the robot can become autonomous on specific task things. I know I keep repeating task specific because I don't want anybody to think that these are autonomous robots that can think and act like a human being and decide to do something else. Well, maybe I'll just blow off my job or really do a bad job because I'm tired of these humans. Uh, th those are the fears that we deal with. And honestly, they're completely unfounded and stupid. If they understood the capabilities of what machine learning and AI could do now, uh, what AI could do now, they would understand how unfounded this is. So 
uh, I want to go to this. I just want to, first of all, go through your amazing CV. And I want to touch, uh, because this, this is quite interesting as well. It's like a, a wrap up of a puzzle. So you are as well working as a founding board member of, of Blockchain Commission for Sustainable Development, which is support um, from the Office of Partnerships at the UN General Assembly. So can you can you tell us about this? And then I have a lot of questions, but bigger, that we'll put that after the a bit of a... Okay, okay. so, um, you know, the we started off as a nonprofit. How all this happened was honestly, it's so strange. Um, not strange, but really wonderful. Now, I got a call at 11 o'clock at night when I was in New York uh, from a friend who had launched an IGO. An IGO is an intergovernmental organization um, by, you know, Lawrence Bloom, and he had said, "Can you help us out? We have 30 people coming to a meeting in New York tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And I'm looking at the time; it's like 11 p.m. the night before, and." Um, you know, we were supposed to host it at MIT, but it's fallen through. And so can you help us find a place? And I'm like, uh, well, okay, what's your, but so I just like called a bunch of people and be like, hey, um, and I was volunteering at the time at a place called Civic Hall, uh, which is a co-working space for technologists who are looking at creating scalable solutions. Fantastic place, great people. So I called up, you know, uh, the operations person there and I was like, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you book me a room? you know, and I'll give you a credit card from after, afterwards when we get there to pay for it. And so I managed to get them a room. And by the time that um, the organizers had landed um, from San Francisco, had, um, you know, I was able to give them an address to send everybody to. And we held the meeting. And what it was, was it was for a small work, uh, work group that would ask questions. So of the members of the 30, uh, of the 30 people that were there, they each represented um, a different a member of the ecosystem that they were trying to solve. And they were all asked the one question, like what would it take uh, to imagine new business models that would help support sustainable practices, right? What are the business models and what are the things that, and you know, within this group, it was funders, founders, philanthropists, service providers, startups, developers. So like a very broad, representation of the ecosystem uh, to see uh, what answers came up. And each of us uh, took turns around the table to state who we were, what we were building, what we needed and what we had to offer. So it's like, you know, five, five to 10 minutes. And it was all done voluntarily. You show up as a volunteer and you can come and leave as you please, or you can roll on and we'll provide you with donuts and coffee. Uh, 12 hours later, nobody left. Everybody wanted to continue talking and sharing. And then what happened after the first uh, hour, hour and a half of introductions was that uh, people started to organically cluster together in workable groups um, to really like zero in on, on a granular level, the problems that they were trying to solve. So those workshops, then we took it to um, San Francisco and then we answered the question, uh, what is the future of money and, and how do we measure value? And again, it was a representation of people from institutional uh, or family offices, investors, uh, activists, community activists, co-ops, business people, founders, um, people who uh, I guess had you know been challenged, you know, had been challenging banks throughout their career, community activists. So it was a very, very artist also, artists who wanted to figure out, uh, is there a new way of figuring out money so that they made sure they got paid? equitably in, 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 their, in the value that they uh, contribute to society. Very interesting, right? Uh, to have a very broad perspective, but, uh, but focus so that we were all focused on the one problem that we were trying to solve. Uh, so then it went back to New York um, and went back and forth uh, to different cities. Uh, and some, and you know, sometimes it was the same people, sometimes it was a very different group, but it was always very lively. And from the, that was the beginning of when um, uh, it was um, Sergio de Cordova, who uh, was had a good relationship with the Office of Partnerships at the UN, because he already had a foundation called the Public Foundation, and uh, enlisted um, Ephraim Wyeth, who is an amazing community organizer uh, and and content uh, maker and, and maker of events. Uh, I, I came together. And, and decided to form uh, you know, Blockchain for Impact. And then to be able to incubate it with and through the Office of Partnership of the UN General Assembly uh, did, one of, did, did one of many things. One, it would 
offer even a broader range of people at an institutional policy and intergovernmental level that we could see the right com uh, conversations about actually hacking problems. Second, it gave, it gave the technology that was quite nascent, didn't work all that terribly well, but we knew that you know, there was enough money and attention and effort intentionality going into it that it would be. It gave it a, a safe place and, and, a, and a sense of legitimacy uh, with credible actors to then be able to talk honestly about hacking these problems. Um, at, a, at a very high level that um, hadn't been done before. So that's how it started. And me, I was just trying to help somebody get off the space. And then I was trying to help lead uh, better conversations. And then I was inviting people that are normally not represented, which are, you know, the underground, um, you know, Bitcoin maximalists or Ethereum maximalists or different coins and different startup people who are very well-intentioned and who are good practitioners but they're not necessarily household names and they're not necessarily people who would have access or be taken seriously uh, by people who are you know, institutional investors or family offices or um, policy wants. So that's how it all began, was that, you know, uh, that because I'm very comfortable with contradictions uh, and I am only uh, you know, happy to work with people who are principally aligned in, in the type of world that I wanna create, but I have no illusions about the darker forces in this world that I was able to access different groups and kind of weave them together and, and cobble together a universal uh, agenda in a way and, and then to define it. So that was my role. Congratulations, it's really amazing and uh, more important than ever. So I know that uh, uh, you have limited time. So I have probably will do volume two. Let's today do the volume one. So so um, in terms of your work and probably to wrap up, but uh, we have a lot of other things, but you have as well been working with Impulse for Women and Neo mm -hmm. Flow Asset Management. Can you tell us about these two organizations? I think especially they're quite oh, interesting. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Um, uh, Impulse for Women is a global um, network of invitation only uh, uh, of women funders and technologists and founders, kind of like the Chicago network that exists in Chicago and different women's groups. That is women supporting women and women helping women get funding, get funded and mentoring. And so as, as global ambassador of, of New York, um, you know, I participate as much as possible uh, whenever I'm asked um, onto like one-on-one -on -one sessions with different founders and different women on uh, just very granular uh, common sense questions of, you know, expectations on how to learn things and how to, uh, um, how to pitch, um, how to form a story, uh, who do, how do you know who to approach and how long should some of these things take um, and also uh, you know, actively promote them and support them uh, through social media channels. Uh, then there's NeoFlow Asset Management, which is super exciting. Um, the founders are uh, an amazing group of, of, of dedicated human beings uh, who want to see decentralization happen in this world, uh, but relatively de-risked. So the, a lot of growth and a lot of hope around financial inclusion happens with uh, digital assets and cryptocurrencies uh, and yet because the space is uh, very decentralized um, they don't have necessarily um, they don't have the safety guards for investors that are needed in uh, in order for uh, institutional investors and governments to comfortably comfortably come into them um, unless they're developing their own uh, central currencies so uh, neoflow asset management is that happy medium or is that stewarding medium place to be able to onboard uh, fiat currency, but that's very, very strictly and stringently regulated to the highest levels because it's registered in the Cook Islands. And the officers and the founders of, uh, you know, of, this, um, of this fund are you know, um, the Strombeck brothers um, and Joshua Bowles, who comes from a family office, uh, a lifetime, of experience in, um, in uh, family offices and finance uh, with, the, with a great deal of integrity, uh, I would say. I, to have a, a fund, oh, uh, there was a director, a former director of wealth management at UBS, so for institutional banking. Uh, these guys all came together and came up with a way to um, 
in a regulated and, and compliant way, be able to de-risk crypto and using multiple, multiple layers of strategies uh, to be able to credibly bring uh, crypto um, and sorry, I should say digital assets uh, um, to bring traditional currencies on, on chain uh, into, the, into the digital asset ecosystem. Well, I have a lot of questions on this, and this is really <laughs> so. So let's go through. I know that we are in the last uh, probably have space for three, four more questions. Maxim depends. So, um, so your work has been always focused on financial inclusion models, and I will I will paraphrase you. Um, that steps when using artificial intelligence and blockchain, and do you elaborate that AI is for automation, and blockchain yes. attempts for trustless system of transaction. So can you elaborate on this? Because this is actually probably the interstice of everything technology in our society nowadays. Sure. And actually, those systems work really well together. They work together in almost every complex uh, you know, uh, platform or system that's out there. Uh, so you know, my hope and vision has always been that technology is a tool and that it's the business models that always seem to screw things up in how they're used and weaponized against people. Right, uh, never the technology in and of itself. And so um, with AI and robotics and machine learning, uh, if we are able to let the machines and robots take over the say the 10,000 to 100,000 courses of decisions uh, in a consistent way to the, towards the desired result, or we let robots do the work that human beings uh, were never meant to do, shouldn't do, uh, because they're dangerous, they're repetitive, or they require a great deal of uh, physical dexterity that is detrimental in the long run to the welfare of the human. Uh, that's how, uh, those are the projects that I always want to support um, and help build and systems that I want to help build, right? To let um, robots do the work and so that it can free people to be human and humane. And those systems, if they're not supported by the right business models within the, within the systems that make transactions of using those systems, of building those systems, funding those systems, transparent uh, and in a trustless system can be easily subverted and weapon, weaponized. So, is that too broad? I don't know, let's, let's, we, no, can, no, we can no, even no, use a use case. <laughs> No, no, this is amazing. But I, I, can you explain better? Because of course, you and me are completely to this, but I'd like to go more through the layers. And I would like sure. for you as well for you to de define the trustless systems, because I think this is the biggest challenge. Uh, and as well, right, the digital so, yeah. I will tell you, even with Beyond Imagination, uh, with uh, Beyond Imagination's Beyond Me Robot, right? Uh, it has two encryption layers and uses a blockchain-based tokenized system for sovereign identity. What that means is that we don't want the robot to be hijacked by somebody else or hacked, and it's impossible to hack it with a with a post uh, with a with a quantum with a quantum resistant encrypted blockchain system. And second, we need to know um, who it is that's piloting the robot but we also wanna protect users' privacy in a way. And, and so that, that, that approach to programming is called zero knowledge proof. Zero knowledge proof says, I know you are not A, B, or C, a bad actor doing nefarious things, using the robot to say rob a bank or, or you know, coming up with your own private army, but we know that you are, um, you are already a vetted, a stringently vetted um, and validated and credentialed person called citizen A, and I know enough about you to know that you are a good actor. So in order to get to say a validation that is point C or D, right? We just need to have A to B, you are a person and a good actor validated without all the information going through the chain of line all the way to be known to each other. Does that make sense? Yes, completely. Okay. And I think this is going to be the, the biggest challenge of humanity. So, so, I want to touch one thing here because there's three models here. There's the financial inclusion, and we still have 1.5 billion people with financial inclusion, and then actually probably another half a billion with financial exclusion. So there's people that are they have some kind of money, but they don't really have much independence. And if you look about financial, I would say financial autonomy probably is off, off of the world because everyone goes a bit on the Absolutely. edge. Sure. But then sure. you have a, a, a big. Uh, 
right now shift that these technologies and for instance you touch crypto and the, in this podcast there's no problem about digital assets and crypto whatever the term people want to use um we're just open for that um but the challenge right now is that of course this technology that are creating first of all more wealth than ever in history of mankind and faster because we talk, yes. we're talking about billionaires being created in the space of months where if you go to an history you would have to be from a family or a king or something like that to have this kind of wealth and that moment uh, any one of us can become one of those and, and you and me are quite privileged in a lot of ways but but i think the challenge as well this is creating and this is using arari um uh, you've now arari uh key awards that is, is creating like in one end, the homo deus, that is like superhumans, because they have capacity to use this to start doing a lot of other things. But at the same time, it's creating like a, a kind of a zombie slash slave uh, digital social media society, which is kind of, for me, my main concern. So how do you see this when it comes to these areas? Oh, I, I totally hear you. You know what? I know people are afraid of like, you know, robots and they're like, oh, Terminator. And I'm like, no, cp 3 and um, you know, if you have a smartphone, um, trust me, uh, you are being yoked and you are being enslaved uh, by technology. You right? if you so people are frequently afraid of the wrong things when when it comes to technology. And what we're seeing now, uh, you know, we want to make we want to make sure that people are aware as possible about what they pay attention to and 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 how they express themselves or contribute in this world. Right. Uh, so that very much is a concern, but I don't think people would be addicted to their smartphones if they saw hope and activities and being able to do other things to create value for themselves and having it be taught to them uh, in, in, in ways that make sense, that are practical. Um, what we're witnessing now when we say financial inclusion, uh, I used to hope and dream, you know, and this was like 10 years ago, and that financial inclusion meant that we could give everybody an opportunity um, to be able to, uh, you know, be included and and um, and and to create value for themselves. And having like ten years later, I realized it's not everybody. I only want the people who are adaptable, who are humble enough to learn, and who want to work really hard towards creating value for themselves and security. It's not everybody. It's only those who are willing to do the work to adapt and to learn and to do the work. And those, those are the only people that I want partaking in this, digital, uh, in this digital economy because that's what it takes, right? And so I think that people will be able to vote through their efforts uh, by learning actively as much as possible. And there's so many different ways. I'm not saying that it's easy, but I'm saying there's nothing in this world that you can't learn once you put some hard work to it. And that's everybody. Uh, what we're witnessing in this history is simply the greatest tran wealth transfer in, the hi in, in all of the history of the world through technology, from um, legacy systems and from, from legacy systems and power structures into actual, uh, into from to technologists and to people who uh, are technologically friendly and savvy, but that doesn't mean that it's it's a restricted group. The only barrier to entry is knowledge and learning and effort. So you know, I would say you know, with crypto and digital assets, um, five years ago, absolutely, it was almost impossible to know what to what to buy, how to contribute. And, and how to hold and how to be a part of the system. But in the last two years with um, decentralized finance, what we call DeFi protocols um, that are relatively de-risk and, and that are non-custodial, which means that you never have to give up control over your wallet or your keys. That, um, and with very, I, I wouldn't say easy, um, but not, not too onerous a way of learning how to yield and farm and stake to provide uh, you know, to liquidity pools, there are ways that everyday people, there are more ways than ever, than every than everyday people to have, to have value and to find value and keep that value for themselves uh, using digital assets. This is exactly the way to go. So, so I want um, one question, and I know that I think you are in your last time available, at least for now. So one of the things is, of, of course, you touched a very good positive way of using this so let's look at the, um, so at the moment we have, of course, blockchain and AI, which we talk and as well, the digital assets, which is transforming society and creates the trustless 
a special digital presence because as we digitize our cities, our society, ourselves, we have these digital wins, the metaverse, all these different things that we are getting into this. And of course, this is your area of expertise. And of course, you are building robots with some of the people that are the most advanced and some of the superstars on these areas. But so I want to touch one thing. So when it comes, and as I know that you are a thought leader as well. So we have, and of course, coming from South Korea, which is one of the most technological advanced countries in the world. So from a perspective, and Canada as well. So from a perspective of society, at the moment, I always use uh, science fiction as a metaphor. Actually, today, as we speak, it, it's fiction. quite interesting <laughs> because it's, tr it's trending on Twitter that uh, William Schaffner is going to be um, uh, on, a, on a trip with Blue Ocean to the, to, 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 the, to, the sc to the space, which is quite interesting because imagination and reality are not so far anymore. So, nope. um, uh, so I think how do you see society, especially concepts of society 5.0, that is more positive about creating a super intelligent society that uses technology to empower humanity, not the other way, which is partly what you're doing. And there's a concept as well that was more or less created by uh, an adm advisor for the, the Japanese government that is right now in the OECD. And as well, your work with the United Nations. So how do you wrap up this? And how can we go from the theory to the practice? Because of course you are working with all these organizations. So you are already on that. But the challenge, and this is my question, is when we look at people, and a lot of even, I, 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 as you know, I've been teaching in business schools, and of course, like you mentioned, in crypto, very easily we find very crypto, very kind of some scary people, but that's life. It's not just the crypto. <laughs> um, but, uh, but as well, we have wonderful people, and sometimes one person can destroy the entire reputation. But what I'm interested in right now is more, how do you see us, in, and I know that you're very focused on writing and thinking. How can we make sure that, uh, and I think that's the risk of that coming back to our area and other people are, are talking about, is that we can actually really create a, um, a humanity, humanity of, of uh, slaves or humanity of superhumans being controlled by, by, by or, or you, superhumans controlling the rest of humanity. And as well, both in money that is already happening, um, and that is kind of new, in, it's not new in history, but at the same time, we have, it's a bit complex question, but I would like to have your notes yeah. on this as a wrap up for this first uh, part. You know, we have the saying that, you know, I'm not about taking down the man. I'm just about building a better system that more people will want to use, right? And the only way to fight this information is not to counter uh, point for point the lies that are being told, because all then you do is do is reinforce the power of the liars, right? I'm about telling a better story and ones that people will want to remember and look at and read more. And so how do we manifest these systems in a way? First of all, founders should talk. We should talk about problem solving. We should talk about um, to each other. And there is a great, you know, at a, at a very high technical level, I think there's a great deal of information uh, sharing and collaboration in AI, in blockchain, in business uh, and systems, uh, because that's uh, all of us who are really passionate about what we do. We crave fellowship with other people who are in similar uh, modes of problem solving. Uh, and second is to look at build something useful and only, you know, and only put your money into things that are useful. That's it. And you can vote like with your attention, you can vote with your dollar. <laughs> Let's, um, I think in what we were talking uh, in terms of uh, related with this complexity of the utility, which I love as well. I'm always a pragmatic, I use pragmatic, you use utility. It's interesting how we use similar words. <laughs> But I think yeah. the point is, so how can we use this utility or pragmatism to really make a difference? And of course, you have a lot of experience with social impact. I know that is not easy as well, because there are more radical ways of looking at these, less radicals. But in the end of the day, you cannot just be at home and just watch the world uh, go in, in a lot of crazy directions, as well as a lot of wonderful things. I would like your final words on this. Uh, and I know that is the limited time. Um, and thank you so much for your time on this. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I want everybody, no matter where they are in terms of, you know, their, their financial uh, situation or um, their socioeconomic status or where they are in life and what profession they have, you know, to ask themselves, you know, is it true? Is it useful? Is it kind? Uh, and that's um, to use your attention, to your focus, your energy, 
uh, your awareness, your dollars through those three filters at all times. Thank you so much, Susan. So just where people, I think, of course, you, you are in social media, but where can people read about you? Can you just tell us, of course, we put all this in, in the interview, but I think it's always good to come from you, the places where people can find more about you, about what you're writing, what you're doing, and so forth. Oh, man, um, I'm on social media. I'm on all of them. I don't have a website because I just never, um, you know, I was actually really shocked when people were, were actually really interested in my work in a way because, you know, we, we try to work so hard for so many years, uh, you know, as, as, you know, entrepreneurs and, and builders and founders, you're just trying to, you know, work knowingly in unknowingness, <laughs> trying to figure out how to make things work. Um, so, yeah, if you just Google Susan O, spelled O-H, um, blockchain and AI, I should pop up in different social media panel, uh, social media handles. And um, yeah, shoot me a Twitter or Facebook invitation and I'll have a look at it. Well, Susan, it's been a, a wonderful pleasure. Of course, I have a lot of more questions because I love to speak about you about ideas. We didn't spoke about a lot of things, but there's still one hour of fantastic content here for people listening to us. Um, uh, I want to, first of all, congratulations on all excellent work. I wish the best for B Omni, Behind Imagination, which I'm going to be following up very close and um, as well for all the all the initiatives and the uh, rest and take care but thank you so much okay be well uh, thank you so much guys that was so much fun dennis bye bye <laughs>